dear colleagues, um, Jumbo, good afternoon. Uh, sorry, uh, we are starting a bit late. Uh, we had some uh, technical uh, hitches, uh, but we're glad that you are able to join us uh, this afternoon. Um, again, sorry for that little bit uh, of hitch. Uh, I hope uh, from now on, we'll have a smooth ride. Uh, again, Asante Nisana, uh, uh, afternoon, Yaleo. I, I know I'm talking to Tanzanians and you always have a joke about us Kenyans not being at par in Kiswahili. But for you, whoever is speaking our speakers, if you're comfortable with Kiswahili, it's okay to go ahead with the Kiswahili. And, uh, and I want to welcome you all. I thank you for joining us in this webinar dedicated to Tanzanian reporters, but of which we are joined by colleagues from the East African region. My name is Kiondo Wawero, the project manager for the Internews Earth Journalism Network. East African Conservation and Wildlife Project, and I'll be your host this afternoon. Uh, you will hear more about us uh, from our director, uh, James Fan, uh, who is yet to join us, but I'm sure he'll be joining us uh, at some point. Uh, joining us also behind the scenes is Ben Onoluka, our investigative journalism editor, as well as our te technical assistant, Stefano. Uh, ben Onoluka might step in uh, if anything happens to my net connection or any other technical hitch. Uh, so in the last couple of months, we have held similar country specific webinars for Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda. Uh, most of you applied to our investigative story production stipends on illegal wildlife and other environmental crimes. And we hope that this series of webinars will arm the successful applicants with tools and information that will help them while working on their stories. The webinars are also a good resource for those who are not selected. Keep visiting our web website, which is earthjournalism.net uh, for more resources and opportunities. We encourage you to keep applying to relevant opportunities as and when available. Before I introduce our speakers for today, please note a few things that will help us have a smooth experience. As we'll be having a question and answer session of the presentations, please type your question into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. If you look at the bottom of the screen, we see that feature, but please do not use the chat feature. Use the Q&A feature again to ask your questions. When you're asking the questions, please tell us who you are, where you work and where you're joining us from. Be sure to direct your question to the specific speaker you'd like to hear from. Kindly note that we will be recording this webinar and we will upload it on our website uh, once it's ready after the webinar and for posterity. You can keep on coming to uh, watch, listen to it, and also the other investigative webinars that we have had for the countries I've mentioned, and also others, many more we've done as uh, EJN Global. Today we have an array of experienced speakers uh, from James uh, Fan, uh, Internews, uh, as Journalism Executive Director. We'll talk about our work and how to source for stories, and then we have Salome Tomari, an award-winning journalist who will tell us what it takes to do great investigative stories. Atilio Tagalile will share tidbits from a combination of journalism and conservation experience. Uh, today, we are happy uh, to have uh, Paul Kandushi, uh, who will be talking uh, about, uh, about why East African Association of Prosecutors have recently launched a website in relation to fighting wildlife crime. And uh, I, I want to find out if we have the, before I call the first speaker, I need to find out uh, James has not joined us. Uh, so I guess our first speaker uh, will go to Mr. Paul Kandushi, uh, who is the director asset for FHR, Transnational and Specialized Crime Division at the National, National Prosecution Service of the United Republic of Tanzania. He's also a director with the East African Association of Prosecutors. He has worked as the head of environmental crime section with the National Prosecution Service. Mr. Kandushi's career has therefore been largely defined by his achievements in the fight against illicit wildlife trafficking through prosecution in Tanzania. Today, uh, he will be talking about his ex ex uh, wide ranging experience as a prosecutor and what you as the reporters can do uh, to raise uh, awareness on the work uh, they, are, they are doing. 
Mr. Paul Kandushi will be with us for one hour. Uh, something urgent came, he'll be telling us about that and he's not able to share his PowerPoint, but he'll be speaking to these, uh, to, how I've, to what I've been introducing about. Uh, so we have him for a few minutes. So please ask the questions as he speaks now. Uh, put your questions on the Q&A and then we'll put them to him immediately after this. So Mr. Paul Kandushi, thank you so much. Good afternoon and the floor is yours. Thank you, Waweru, for uh, that nice introduction. Uh, I, I should uh, definitely extend my apology. Uh, initially, I, I was to take part uh, uh, in the whole of this webinar, but uh, I'm in the middle of the road trip, which I have to uh, complete. Uh, uh, and uh, therefore, I will share my experience as introduced. And uh, just, to just to start, I wish to highlight that for the past 10 years, I've been actively uh, involved in the, in the fight against poaching as the head of the prosecution uh, section within the National Prosecution Services in the United Republic of Tanzania. And uh, I should also note that at the time when I was made head of the, of the section, that was 2014, 2015, uh, Tanzania had just discovered that we had lost 60.3% uh, of our elephant population. So we had more than 100, uh, 100,000 uh, elephants. Actually, it was uh, 109,000 elephants uh, in the year uh, 2009, only to discover that in the span of five years, that was 2014, uh, we only had 43,000 elephants, which was equivalent to the demise of about 60.3% of our elephant population. And uh, to make matters worse, uh, Tanzania uh, as a community, uh, it was like nobody knew um, that we were heading towards extinction of elephants. And um, even in, 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 in cases, court cases, uh, nobody, took, nobody took them seriously. I cannot remember of any single case, a high profile case, which uh, I was able to, uh, to uh, attract media attention before 2014. And uh, not only attention of the media, but also attention of law enforcement agencies and, and my fellow prosecutors. So we, we, all, we all looked at these cases as minor cases, and uh, we spent much of the resources and uh, energy in other cases. And uh, so we, I mean, everyone thought uh, these are just minor cases. Nobody cared. And uh, as I said, nobody knew that we were losing so much elephants. And... Uh, uh, the reasons for uh, the main reason for the demise of uh, of these poor uh, uh, magnificent creatures was the uh, the lucrative uh, nature of the trafficking uh, uh, business that was going on between Africa and uh, mainly Southeast Asia. So you see, one would uh, one would, uh, would 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 take. A, a task which weighs approximately between 25 kilograms to 50 kilograms. And at that particular point in time, uh, one kilogram, one could buy one kilogram of, uh, so you see, as I said, uh, the average weight is 25, let's say 30 kgs, but one kg, uh, one would be able to buy from the black market in, in, in Dar es Salaam. Um, Tanzania. Uh, they equivalent 50 USD, but the same one kg would would be sold at the price of more than 2,000 USD, uh, you know, in Southeast Asia. So take 2,000 uh, USD times the amount of kilogram that one elephant task would have, maybe 25 kilograms or 30 kilograms. So the business be became so creative, and uh, 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 slowly we noticed trends whereby people, drug traffickers and other criminal syndicates moved away from other types of trafficking and uh, they all moved into trafficking uh, uh, wildlife products, especially rhino horns and elephant tusks, as I said, because of the creative nature of the, of the deal. The risks, the risks were very low. As I said, nobody knew, nobody paid attention. The prison sentences, uh, the sentences for uh, upon conviction were also very low. Uh, the judiciary did not pay much attention. We prosecutors did not pay much attention because we had no idea that uh, we were facing a huge problem. 
so I'm I'm saying this because uh, uh, something might be happening and uh, nobody knows that it is a problem, and we all know the number one uh, the number one uh, role of a journalist is to tell the society what exactly is happening, uh, to raise awareness in the society, and so forth. And above all, education, public education is very important. And so uh, when we discovered uh, of these uh, dynamic trends of illicit wildlife trafficking uh, in the United Republic of Tanzania, uh, Tanzania as a government started taking stern measures. We established what we call a national anti poaching task force. We also established a dedicated uh, group of prosecutors in the environmental crime section in the National Prosecution Service. Uh, we increased the law. The minimum sentence was increased up to 20 years. And so many other measures which were taken by the government as a whole. But as I said, even when we took such measures, uh, the media did also, did also did not take, uh, did not, I mean, we were, we were not able to attract the attention of the media. And I would speak of one case, the Queen of Ivory case, uh, which I would say was, to me, was the, was the first case which attracted uh, the attention of the media. Uh, I'm sure everyone can Google Queen of Ivory uh, case uh, in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, where we were able to get headlines from BBC, from CNN, Fox News, Al Jazeera, uh, you know, New York Times. I mean, if you just write in the Google Queen of Ivory, you would, you know, you'd, you'd find headlines from all sort of, you know, those major media outlets. So that was the very first case, which I would say, really, really attracted the attention of the media, both within and outside Tanzania. And since uh, that time, uh, somehow the society in Tanzania started paying attention in these cases. Uh, people knew about uh, the impending uh, danger of extinction of elephants that nobody uh, was aware of. And uh, uh, the media started uh, you know, these educative programs and. Uh, giving much attention to the headlines in relation to uh, wildlife cases, which, as I said, somehow uh, made the society become aware of the problem. And since then, other cases uh, started gaining at my much att attention. And uh, I remember the second case was uh, one accused person uh, famously known as uh, uh, the devil. His name is Boniface Maliango, aka the devil. He was very famous within the media to the extent that uh, Netflix made a movie called The Ivory Game, which was directed by Leonardo DiCaprio. So I'm saying all this because uh, all these uh, uh, trends started, I mean, with the media started in 2016, 2017, 2018. But I, you, couldn't, you couldn't find anything in the media between 2010 and 2015 in relation to... Uh, to the problem of illicit wildlife trafficking. And therefore, as a prosecutor, uh, I would uh, call upon uh, journalists uh, and the media as a, as a, as a whole, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, to realize their position in this, in this war. Uh, we can do so much, but uh, if, the, if the society is not being informed, if the, the population, if the community is not aware of uh, whatever is going on within the society, uh, that in itself is a problem. And therefore, I would uh, proceed to commend uh, the media in East Africa, in Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, and elsewhere, because now uh, in illicit wildlife trade. And I see this in, not only in Tanzania, but also in Uganda and Kenya. And I see, I see uh, this uh, new development, this, uh, this, these new trends as a good sign that uh, finally uh, the media has taken up its, uh, its role uh, in the fight against uh, illicit wildlife trade. And uh, as a veteran wildlife prosecutor, uh, I'm very much sure that uh, with the media playing its role, our work will be known. And uh, uh, speaking of our work, uh, you, might, you, might, you might all be aware of the recent uh, uh, establishment of uh, a special website which has been set up by the uh, East Africa Association of Prosecutors uh, dedicated uh, in combating illicit wildlife trade. 
So the East Africa Association of Prosecutors is a non-governmental entity made up of prosecution agencies in the East African states, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Burundi, Rwanda, and South Sudan, uh, which came together and established this serve as a platform or a portal for prosecutors uh, across the region to share experiences, to share news with whatever is happening, to share new, uh, what we call a precedent. Uh, and precedent, these are case laws, important case laws, which might uh, assist uh, prosecutors across, across the region. So for instance, uh, if the Court of Appeal of Kenya decides uh, a certain case and passes a certain principle of the law, which is important, the same principle of the law can equally be applied by a prosecutor in Tanzania, uh, though the precedent would be persuasive and not binding, but uh, that, that persuasion, persuasion itself could, could, could prove to be very important in deciding a case, uh, taking a principle from a case in Uganda or in, in, or in, uh, in Kenya. And therefore, uh, uh, this particular website, as I said, uh, which is yet to be operational. It was uh, uh, launched uh, last year, but we are waiting for some formalities, including the final endorsement by the executive committee of the EAP. And once it becomes operational, everyone will have access to it. The media, the journalists can uh, easily access it and see what, uh, what is really happening in terms of prosecution and investigation of uh, wildlife cases, poaching cases, and uh, illicit wildlife trade in the, in, across the region, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, South Sudan, Burundi, and Rwanda. And therefore, this website uh, uh, could be a very important uh, tool because uh, if you just go through it uh, as a journalist, you might be able to, uh, uh, to have a source, source, sort of a single source of information. I mean, you just go in there and you can easily uh, get news as I said, court decisions, important court decisions, and other development of the law uh, from across the region. You wouldn't have to go to each individual uh, country to see what is really happening in terms of uh, 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 efforts by the law, inv uh, law investigative agencies and prosecution agencies in terms of uh, investigation and prosecution of wildlife cases. And uh, I'm sure once uh, that website becomes live, uh, it will be shared to, to the public. And uh, even this particular forum will, will have an opportunity uh, to go through it. And uh, I, I would call upon each and every one of you uh, to pay much attention to it, to utilize it. Of course, uh, it will have some restriction in terms of uh, membership. There will be that side where only prosecutors will be able to access. But I can tell you even that side, the front side of it, which should be accessible to, uh, to, the, to the public, to the Journal public to the to the media to the journalists, even investigative journalists, would still uh, be a very important tool uh, for you guys. And uh, I'm sure together we can we can win this we can be, we can win this war. This is a very important war, a very important fight, and each and every one of us has a role to play. I, as a prosecutor, I have my role to play, but the media, uh, my fellow uh, colleagues in the media industry you have a very, very big role to play. So that would be all from my side and uh, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to receive questions from you. And I would again apologize for uh, being here only shortly because I have to, uh, to proceed or continue with my road trip. But uh, as far as this subject is concerned, thank you very much. Asante sana and greetings from Tanzania. Asante sana, uh, Mr. Kandushi. Uh, we appreciate you. It's a privilege to have someone uh, of your level and caliber and a prosecutor at that, you know, joining us. It's not always as a journalist, uh, we get to interact uh, with uh, the law uh, and the most of the stories that we do really, you know, concern the law. And uh, we appreciate your time and uh, your presentation are uh, really uh, good. And uh, I can see about the three questions that I put to you. Uh, but before this, uh, you've mentioned about, you know, president, uh, president from uh, case laws uh, that you'll be learning from your peers in the other East African countries. And this reminded me 
uh, I've been reading stories, we've been writing stories about uh, about the war against illegal wildlife crime. Uh, one of the problems being that uh, only uh, the small fish uh, seems to be arrested and prosecuted. Uh, what can you say about these and what, uh, what why do you, what would you say like there was, you've mentioned, you know, the Ivory Queen, and I, I remember there was, you know, a, another big fish uh, in Kenya, uh, Mombasa, who actually uh, was let go uh, at the prosecu prosecution stage. Uh, what would you say about these? And uh, yeah, please. And then I'll read to you the other questions. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, this is a very important question because um, you journalists should know that uh, uh, wildlife crime uh, takes form of any other type of unorganized crime. So you see there are plenty of other types of organized crimes, drug trafficking, arms trafficking, human trafficking, and terrorism and so forth. So all these uh, crimes are organized crimes and wildlife crime is one of them. Actually, uh, currently it is the fourth largest uh, uh, organized crime in terms of revenues. Uh, the first one being drug trafficking. So just like drug trafficking, wildlife crime has uh, what we call poaching levels or poaching pipeline. So you have about five levels of, of, of this pipeline on how exactly uh, this crime is carried out. So you'd have people in level one. These are the actual people who kill elephants. These are the people who go to the forest and they're the ones who do the actual poaching. And these sit at the bottom of what we can uh, imagine uh, as a pyramid, uh, pyramid-like uh, structure. So pyramid-like structure at the bottom, which is the largest uh, in terms of size, uh, you find the level one offenders. And as I say, these are low-level offenders. They receive the lowest amount of uh, amount of revenues. They are the ones they what we call expendable foot soldiers. So you can arrest a hundred of them, prosecute them convict them and even send them out to jail for 30 years or 20 years. But the problem will still be there because someone level three or level four would simply go and, you know, employ other people, other expendable foot soldiers to proceed with uh, the poaching. So at level two, which follows way up the chain of a pyramid like structure, these are the, these are the, people, the facilitators. They're the ones to provide weapons, the modes of transportation to people in level one. They are not the ones who go to the forest to kill, but they would wait for that, for that kill to happen. They're the ones who would facilitate provision of the weapon, uh, modes of transportation. And they're the ones who are the first receivers of, of, of the trophies, the rhino horns or elephant tusks. And once they receive that trophy, they would transport and, uh, uh, and make sure that it reaches people in level three. So people in level three, these are, these are somehow big fish. They're not the biggest fish like in level four, but they are the big fish because they are the ones doing the large collection of, of ivory. So, I mean, these are fewer in terms of numbers. Uh, they are well and economically, financially, they're financially well. Uh, they are the ones who uh, uh, enable or provide finance, funds, funding and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and resources to people in level two. And just like the level two, the difference between these people, level three and level two, uh, these ones, they sit far away from the actual crime. You'd find them in urban centers. Uh, they would pretend to be uh, owners of legit business enterprises, but in the, in the, in the back door, they, they are the ones. Uh, really making the large collection of, of ivory and they would pass that ivory to people in level four numbers. And uh, most of them operate in territories. So you'd find one individual running a certain zone, uh, controlling it, uh, being the sole uh, collector. And uh, they are the ones to enable uh, the shipping, uh, you know, the uh, shipping out of, of these large consignments of elephant tusks uh, or rhino horns to Southeast Asia. And uh, some of them are foreigners, uh, for instance, uh, Vietnamese people, we, we have had cases where we would charge Vietnamese people, people from China and the rest of the Southeast Asia. I'm not saying that we have never uh, arrested 
someone from Europe or USA, but in terms of numbers, uh, and some of them would have resided in a country for a long time, and uh, they would be running legit businesses, but as I say, behind the curtain, they are the last exporters. I mean, they're the ones doing the actual exportation of, you know, large, large, large consignments of ivory uh, uh, through ports and other modes of transportation out of the country. And they would usually conceal the, 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 the contraband with other legit uh, items like timber um, and other agricultural products. And uh, the, these, the, the level five now, the level five people are the final consumers of these uh, products. They are the people, rich people buying uh, bangles, um, uh, you know, eating chopsticks and, um, you know, all sorts of decorations, plates, and all sorts of very expensive uh, items being sold in large cities in Southeast Asia. So they are the final buyers of the products. And most of them have no idea that they are buying they are buying items with blood on them because they have no idea that uh, 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 elephants or rhinos were poached uh, 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 and and as a result of which they are they are now able to buy these these items and uh, to them it's it's a symbol of prestige uh, if you are a, a, a rich person in these in these countries. Uh, is one of the, of, of the signs to show people that you are rich, uh, you would have these items. You would, the day when you welcome your, your counterparts and you, are, you want to sh you really them to respect you, you would have them eat with chopsticks made of uh, elephant tusks, uh, wearing bangles, uh, even tables made of ivory. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff and being sold at crazy prices out of, out of the elephant tusks. And of course, other types of wild products that are being used for other purposes, medicinal purposes, for instance, uh, pangolin scales uh, and rhino, rhino horns and so forth. So, uh, but the bottom line is, I mean, they're very expensive when they reach uh, the country of destination. I mean, people would uh, go uh, miles, they would use corruption and all sorts of ways to make sure that they reach the final product. And just like drug trafficking, uh, this is how this crime takes place. So coming back to your question, how do we get to these kingpins, the people in level four and level three? It's not an easy task. As I said, these people sit far away from the actual crime. You would never find them with any of this stuff, just like drug traffickers. You, you will never find a, a, you know, a, a drug kingpin sitting with drugs in his house. It is somebody else in level one who does the actual sale in the streets that you would always arrest. But uh, as a result of uh, prosecution-led investigation, financial investigation, follow the money, where you will be able to use these other tools, uh, financial investigation, you would be able to trace, for instance, financial transactions between these levels and uh, charging them with other types of crimes. I mean, you can never charge them with possession of ivory, but you can always charge them with money laundering or leading organized crime or participating in criminal book and racketeering. So we have been using these types of offenses. We have been uh, deploying, even establishing national anti-poaching task force, uh, well equipped with resources and capabilities and expertise uh, to, to carry out financial investigation, uh, to carry out uh, surveillance and other sort of uh, uh, methods or techniques of investigation to be able that we get evidence against them and Queen of Ivory, uh, Boniface Maliango, aka the devil. And I mean, we have so many cases where people in level three and level four in Tanzania have been arrested. Prosecuted and convicted. I'm 15, where four Chinese nationals were arrested with 11 rhino horns in the southern uh, part of Tanzania. I mean, the prosecution, to, uh, the trial uh, took about uh, 21 days. And at the end of 21 days, they were all convicted and sentenced to serve 20 years imprisonment. I think three of them managed to, uh, to be acquitted by way of appeal, but one, the one who was actually found with the items, still serves a 20 years imprisonment with a fine of 24.5 million USD, which I'm not sure he'll be able to, to pay. So 
these people in level four, level four and three, we are not prosecuting them. And it, there is, it's no wonder we see a poaching levels uh, going down and uh, we see an increase in the population, elephant population is coming up very much because think of it, if you take out individuals in level three and level four, I mean, there will be no business for people in level two and level one. I mean, why would they go to kill elephants if they know they will not be able to sell them, you know, at people level three and level four? So you take out level four and level three, I mean, you solve the problem. You take out a thousand people in level one, the problem will still be there. Yeah, so that would be my response to your question. Wow, thank you so much, Mr. Kandushi, for that elaborate uh, response. And you've really, you know, given us a lot of, as a journalist, a lot of uh, insights, you know, that will form our future work and also story ideas. Like uh, I've always, you know, racked my brain on how to tell this story, but it's it's, it's great that you're tell, telling us to follow the money, you know, financial illicit flows, you know, to, 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 to crack these uh, organized crimes. That's a really good aspect of that. I, I know you really want to leave, uh, so I'll ask you just two more questions uh, from our journalists. There are about 11 questions already. Uh, but but Abjata Khalif uh, from Kenya, as I said, uh, we have uh, this for Tanzania. Uh, they're the majority, but uh, we also encourage other uh, uh, reporters from our network to join. Uh, so Abjata is asking, is Tanzania a conduit for illegal world of trade from landlocked South African development uh, countries? Uh, and on the same related to that, he's asking is Al Shabaab insurgents causing havoc in Mozambique uh, through the northern region bordering Tanzania? Uh, are they benefiting from illegal water of trade? Um, uh, he has another question, but we won't ask that one. Probably you can take those two uh, as you answer uh, Felix um, Wakiembe. Uh, he says, Yes, Paul, uh, the media has a role to play in combating wildlife crime. But how do you, as the government, engage the media so that it performs its role effectively? I think that's a good question. Thank you. So I would, uh, I would respond to the first two questions. Tanzania yeah. is predominantly a country of origin, uh, just like Kenya, uh, Kenya and Tanzania, because uh, if you look at, uh, I don't know if I'm going to remember, uh, but this index which uh, keeps uh, all records of all seizures, of all seizures of elephant tusks, for instance, across the globe. Uh, I think it's called monitoring illegal killing of elephants, which is being run by CITES and uh, in collaboration with other uh, agencies. Um, uh, at that time, when I, I told you we were suffering, we were uh, uh, experiencing uh, black, uh, I would say, very bad experience in terms of poaching, uh, 2009 in in, in 2014. Uh, so according to this database, uh, both Mike and Wise, 70% of all seized uh, ivory came from East Africa, mainly Tanzania and second Kenya. And most of these trophies came from uh, Selugian Reserve. So all these data are in the official uh, annual reports of the United Nations, uh, United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, UNODC. Uh, the MIC and the WISE databases, which I say they're being run by CITES and other stakeholders. And therefore, uh, Tanzania and Kenya, these are mainly countries of origin. And uh, most of the trophies which is being exported out there during uh, those dark times, 2014, 2015, itself. Yes, we have had cases where DRS Burundi uh, coming all the way to Dar es Salaam port. For instance, in, 20, uh, in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, if not 2016, we had a seizure of six tons of a pangolin scales. And uh, we had evidence that most of it came from Burundi and we are seeing led uh, by a Mali national who also had a Ugandan uh, nationality. He had a dual uh, citizenship uh, residing in Kampala. And therefore, this seizure uh, led to a successful ex execution of uh, two extradition requests, one in Rwanda and the other one in, uh, in Uganda. And therefore, these uh, high-level uh, criminals were extradited, extradited from Uganda and Rwanda, and they were brought here in Tanzania and they faced justice here in Tanzania. 
So uh, pre- uh, Tanzania is predominantly a country of uh, origin, but as I said, few cases where you'd find trophies coming out of Tanzania. And uh, secondly, uh, is it something to do with the, the insurgency in Mozambique, correct? And whether uh, they benefit from... Yes, he's actually asking about Al-Shabaab. Uh, there is a prevalence, I guess, in uh, uh, Somalia, but he's asking uh, the Al-Shabaab insurgents causing havoc in Mozambique, oh, yeah. northern region bordering Tanzania, are they benefiting from the illegal border of trade? No, I, ca- I cannot, I cannot uh, confirm uh, the, that question with a set, with certainty. Uh, I know there have been uh, suggestions, not only in Mozambique, but uh, in all other areas where you, had, you would have instability in DRC Congo, the ADF and all that. Uh, so that has, uh, that has, has still been an, a, a great area for research, whether uh, illicit wildlife trafficking uh, 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 is being used to fund uh, activities of these terrorist group, groups. So it is an area where some researchers have said yes, but I'm, I'm aware of some research work which says there is no proof that illicit wildlife trade uh, do actually fund uh, terrorist activities in DRC Congo. I cannot speak much about what is happening in Mozambique, whatever is happening there. Uh, some uh, researchers have opined that legal wildlife trade do, re- do actually do, uh, funds uh, terrorist activities. And I'm aware of other uh, researchers who concluded that there is no sufficient proof uh, uh, to show that uh, illegal wildlife trade was used to fund activities of these terrorist groups. I'm aware of uh, illegal logging, the timber, the illegal timber trade. Uh, we have so much uh, data and uh, uh, research uh, uh, studies which uh, show that terrorists in DRC Congo use uh, revenues from illegal logging uh, to fund their terrorist activities in that area. But I would, I, I'm not able to confirm whatever is happening in Mozambique. I do not have much information about it. And therefore, I would just simply use uh, those research studies which were conducted in, in, uh, in the area where you'd have insurgency, insurgencies in Somalia and DRC. But as I can say, I cannot confirm which position is correct. And, and maybe my colleagues, investigative journalists, um, uh, you might be interested in uh, looking into it and uh, uh, release uh, some of your work, either proving or disapproving uh, uh, the, the truth of this uh, this information. Thank you. Uh, that's that's for sure. We'll take up the challenge. But in the meantime, we do hope you could share with us the data and the research that you have. And then I see on the comments somebody is asking for your contacts. I hope you allow us to share you your email. And uh, we would like to share resources. Uh, I will follow up with you. Benon will follow up with you to see if you can get us those research papers or point us to where we can find them to help us in our work. Uh, So we have another question uh, that I would like to tie with mine. You know, uh, like uh, you've been mentioning uh, pangolin scales and uh, poaching of pangolin. And I think this is something that we are reading has gone up in recent times, but uh, I mean, uh, a WhatsApp group of uh, senior media journalist who, who somebody was asking, what's this pangolin? And I, I also heard uh, somewhere in Kenyan court, a magistrate also was uh, presented with pangolin scales and he didn't know what that was. Uh, so uh, I'll ask Peter Murori's question related to that. How well are uh, prosecutors in Tanzania trained to adequately prosecute the complex wildlife crimes? Uh, you know, trying to that yeah. anecdote, yeah. Yeah, so as I said, since 2015, Tanzania the country and the, uh, our government took uh, key and stern measures to combat uh, poaching and illegal wildlife trade. Uh, the National Prosecution Service, which is a prosecution agency in the country, established a dedicated uh, section uh, dealing specifically with environmental crimes, uh, including uh, poaching and wildlife, wildlife trafficking. And then the DPP, the Director of Public Prosecutions, 
uh, issued uh, what is known as a rapid reference guide and standard operating procedures uh, to guide and direct uh, investigators and prosecutors on how well to investigate and prosecute um, uh, wildlife and forestry crimes. We have had uh, the use of tools, important tools, financial investigation and prosecution led investigation. And when I speak of prosecution led investigation is the, is the, is the, new, is the newly adopted uh, mode of investigation where a prosecutor would be guiding investigators uh, during the investigation phase. Uh, uh, in, in the past, we prosecutors would be sitting in our offices waiting for case files from for investigators. And the case files would come a month or two following the incident and you would find flaws and, uh, and uh, shortcomings here and there. And some of them, I mean, are not curable. And uh, you'd find, uh, you know, uh, suspects and accused persons walk scot-free because of these anomalies. So uh, also coming with the complexities of financial investigation and uh, follow the money and uh, all these other tools, uh, somehow it has become a practice across the globe that prosecutors are now actively involved during the investigation phase. And um, this is a very important uh, uh, way of, uh, of handling things because uh, we prosecutors are the final consumers of evidence which is being collected by investigators. So being involved at those at these early stages, we are able to lead uh, complex investigations. We have had trainings and capacity buildings with our prosecutors, training us on, trainings on all these areas, financial investigations, uh, organized crime investigation, uh, uh, surveillance, both electronic and physical. And um, I would also speak of uh, the use of uh, other crimes. We are not only targeting poaching and the actual trafficking, we are looking at money laundering, we are looking at corruption offenses. So once we do that, we are now able to, uh, to capture the whole poaching pipeline, the people in level one all the way to the people in level four. Yes, we may not be able to charge a level four offender with the actual poaching or possession, but we can easily uh, charge him with uh, leading organized crime or money laundering. So through that, we are now able uh, to reach these kingpins and we are really getting them. Uh, you can read the news, uh, you can, uh, I mean, we have, we're having so many convictions here in Tanzania. And uh, we, I mean, poaching has really gone down because of that, because as I said, you take out individuals in level four and level three, I mean, you'd, very few people in level one would be interested to go and poach because they would have no one to sell, to sell to those, those, those contraband. Yeah, so that would be my response. And um, uh, I'm, I would usually call upon our neighbors to emulate, some of these uh, development that we have done in Tanzania as a country, in terms of amendment of the law, uh, the use of uh, a multi-agency approach, task force, uh, the use of other ancillary legislations, money, uh, anti-money laundering um, and uh, organized crime legislations. And through that, you can uh, be able to get uh, the, you know, the high level criminals, the, the, those kingpins. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kandushi. I'm looking at these other questions, and I think you've answered them in one way or the other. Um, you know, like Helen is saying that financial, she believes financial institutions are involved in illegal wildlife crime because most transactions carried out are not monitored. Uh, so what is Tanzania doing to ensure all money transferred or transacted in banks does not involve illegal wildlife trade? And I think you've mentioned this. So probably is to, you know, point us to probably a number, uh, is this happening in, in, uh, in big ways? Is there an example that we can give that uh, we, uh, you know, we, we stopped this case of money laundering or we, we prosecuted these? Uh, do we have such examples? And I think uh, from there, uh, I will let you go. I don't know if you have answered to, uh, to Felix, who is asking, how do you engage uh, the media? Uh, 
when you have these kind of stories? Do you actively seek the media or do we have to come to you? And we know sometimes when we come to you, government people, uh, sometimes we don't get the responses and in time. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Yeah, so I've seen someone chatting in the text box that we should, in the chat box that we should use both English and Swahili. So I would respond this in both languages. Uh, first and foremost, media engagement is key here. It's very important. It, it is actually the crux uh, of the problem, if there is one. I mean, as a prosecutor, I have learned to know that my, my very first friend in whatever I'm doing uh, is a journalist, because the journalist can assist me in sending the message out there. And in that regard, uh, we prosecutors, and specifically our office, I would remember those days where, where we would be afraid even to hold press conferences uh, and tell the media and speak with journalists uh, on what is happening. But recently, since uh, the Queen of Ivory case in 2017, 2018, we, we are now actively engaging the media. We are not running away from journalists. We are very flexible in arranging appointments with uh, journalists uh, for interviews. Uh, for explanation. Sometimes you would have a case, a complex case, and the journalist would be there in court, but they wouldn't really understand what has happened. So we started uh, releasing press releases. We started uh, holding press conferences and even individual interviews with uh, journalists just to make sure that they get the correct story out there, to make sure that they understand exactly what happened in our courtrooms, for them to understand exactly uh, the, the major amendments in our laws. So the engagement is uh, an, an ongoing exercise. I have done it personally at personal level. Even our office has been doing that. And definitely we will keep on doing that and uh, make sure that we enable you uh, journalists and the media as a whole to carry out your, your, your role in the fight against illegal wildlife trade. Kwa Kiswahili tu kwa rakaraka ni seme zamani sisi prosecutors wende shamashtaka na ofisi uh, ilikuwa ni nadra sana kuona eh, baada ya kesi tunafanya press conference au tunatoa uh, press release au mkurugenzo wa mashtaka naongea na wandishu wabari kuhusu kitu fulani uh, be it wildlife trafficking or any other uh, type, type of crime lakini tumeona trend uh, recently uh, sisi ofisi na uh, even at individual level as a prosecutor, to make to engage sana media, uh, to make fanya maudiano ya ana kwa ana. Sometimes, mwandisho wabari anataka ufafanuzi wa kitu fulani. Yeah, schedule yet, unakuta schedule yako iko tight, but you would uh, think of it, you'd think of that interview, unayona una, una yu interview kama moja ya majikumu muhimu ya kwako. Kwa hiyo, lile jikumu la kuongea na mwandisho wabari kumwelezea nini kimetukia makamani, kumwelezea kwa nini huyu mtu ka hukumiwa miaka 20 lakini kuna kesi nyingine eh, same same offense amehukumiwa miaka 10 kuna mazingira unakuta mtu ameachiwa wakati jamii inajua mtu amekamatwa na na contraband kwa hiyo mazingira mengi ambayo sasa hivi tumekuwa tukikubali na tukiwa uh, more open and forthcoming kuandishwa habari kuonana nao na kutoa ufafanuzi juu ya masuala yote haya eh, kwa individual uh, levels prosecutors lakini hata na ofisi na mkurugenzi wa mashtaka amekuwa akifanya hivyo sana Na sio sisi tu ni meona ata eh, ODPP Kenya, eh, ODPP Kenya pia, ODPP Uganda, and eh, ODPP, eh, the PG office in Rwanda and Burundi, na eh, wamekuwa pia wakitoa tarifa kwa uma, wakielezea kila uamuzi ambao wameufanya, eh, kufanya decision to prosecute kwenye hizi cases za wildlife, wanasema, eh, sometimes wanatoa interviews kwa media kufafanua, na hata zile individual interviews, ambazo mwandishi wa habari anaweza kaomba appointment kutana naye aweze kukuhoji utoe ufafanuzi kwenye masuala fulani. Kwa hiyo sisi tumekuwa tuki tukitoa kipao mbele kwenye hilo kwa sababu mimi binafsi ninaamini hiyo eh, ni moja ya majukumu yangu muhimu ya kufanya kwenye kazi yangu ya kuendesha mashtaka. Kwa hiyo naweza nikajibu hivyo kwa ufupi. Asante sana abona Paul Kandushi Kiswahili kitamu sana uh, kwa mwakenya kisikiza mtanzania lakini tumeshukuru sana kwa wakati ambao umetupatia uh, sanane ya leo tukiona uko 
a safari ni na sasa tutakukubalia wende wendele na safari like, lakini i am asking you again that you allow us to share your contacts uh, with the good sure. people that we have here it ni vizuri tumefurahi kuona you been engaging us actively uh, and uh, and it's really good to see that we be able to be asking questions when there is these breaking stories on where we when we doing investigative stories uh, unfortunately we didn't get to see a presentation by our executive director uh, but we'll be doing that at some point uh, although we have to let you go uh, we do give a uh, story stipends to uh, re- reporters we do train them on these issues and we do these such uh, webinars so uh, right now uh, we have journalists uh, from Kenya Uganda Tanzania and Rwanda uh, going to the field to do various investigative uh, uh, stories and i know some people uh, like peter moru who's joined us today is doing a story based uh, on the court process and also have abjata who is doing that story that he has asked the question about insurgents uh, so probably we'll be you know getting in touch with you uh, to be able to give them one on one interviews again thank you so much uh, for your time i do have a nice mm. uh, road trip and uh, thank you. god bless you thank you kwaheri asante sana kwaheri sana Thank you so Salam much. kwa Rwanda Buru, uh, Rwanda uh, Kenya Uganda na wote mnaohudhuria kutoka Tanzania. Nashukuru na jioni njema kwenu wote. Pia wewe. Asante. I have a safe uh, drive. Kwa heri. Uh, that was a good presentation I I hope uh, from Mr. Paul Kandushi. Uh, na sasa Salome uh, Kitomari kama unaweza weka video yako. <laughs> and uh, there is a request that uh, if you are able you can do kiswahili and english when you're doing your uh, presentation uh, we're still waiting for our director james if you would have joined as when salome and achilo do their presentations then i will have to uh, present a bit about our work uh, so i'm going to introduce you salome uh, before okay. uh, and then and then you can share your a presentation I, i hope you can do it uh, now as you uh, you can try and share as i'm looking for your bio uh, which i had a couple of minutes ago but right now it's gone me uh, on me it's gone me missing in action um one minute i'll do that now uh, So what how how long do you want to do this? Uh for me it's like uh 20 minutes. I think it'll be oh. enough. I'll be I'll, I'll try to be hurry as much as I can okay. and uh okay. well we'll understood. Make, we'll make that 15. Uh, so Salome okay. Kitomari, we've worked with you a couple of times. You've joined us in Mombasa for a workshop and uh thank you so much. Uh, for agreeing to do this uh, folks uh, salome is an award winning senior investigative journalist in tanzania who has worked with the leading titles including the guardian and nipashe newspapers he's the chairperson of the media institute of southern africa at the tanzanian chapter she has done a considerable number of investigative stories her work has won several awards including the overall prize in the 2018 excellence in journalism awards uh, she didn't mention uh, with which organization and now salome uh, will go uh, share with us how she does these stories that have won these many awards and uh, salome the floor is yours and karibu sana asante sana waweru habari za mchana habari za jioni waandishi wa habari wenzangu uh, what i'm going to do is to share my experience as a wildlife uh, and uh, environmental reporter and uh, i see i think all of you are seeing my my screen yes we can see okay we can go I'll ahead try yeah. to minimize it yeah yeah uh, i've started with uh, professional issues that i, I think is very important to kumbushane vitu vya kuzingatia why wakati tunafanya story zetu za uandishi wa habari na key issues ambazo ningependa tuzungumzie ni professional standards, quality ya journalism, experience yangu mimi katika ku stories za uhifadhi, mazingira na masuala ya 
migogoro ya, ya wanyamapori na binadamu na masuala ya wildlife for crime lakini pia experience ndio ipata nilipokwenda Thailand Thailand kama tunavyojua wengi kule ni end user product huku ni source ya product za wildlife na kule ni end user ambako wanakwenda kutumia hizi product zinazopatikana hapa nchini lakini pia namna ambavyo ninapata tip na namna ya kupitch story zetu na mifano mbalimbali ya story ambazo nimewahi kuzifanya katika professional standard ambacho ningependa tukumbushane ambacho tumekuwa tukifanya kila siku na ndio hicho ambacho tunakwenda kutupelekea kwenye habari tunazozifanya kwamba ni lazima tuhakikishe tunafanya eco reporting tuna balance story zetu Me, umeandika story labda ina mambo ambayo ni lazima upande wa pili usikike sauti mbalimbali mbali, lazima zisikike kwenye story zetu tunapobalance story na maana habari siku zote lazima iwe kwenye mizania mizani ambayo ina balance pande zote na kuweza kusaidia msomaji kuelewa na kufikia uamuzi au kuchukua hatua lakini pia au kutatua tatizo la eneo fulani kwa sababu unaweza ukafanya solution based journalism ambayo inasaidia jamii ya eneo fulani au watu wa maeneo fulani kuchukua hatua lakini accuracy ni muhimu sana tunajua majina ya watu majina ya mahali title za watu ni lazima kuwa makini tuhakikishe kwamba tunakuwa na habari ambayo imebepata vigezo vyote lakini fairness lazima tuwatendee haki watu wote vitu vyote tunavyoripoti katika habari zetu tuhakikishe kwamba tumebezi katika maeneo hayo kuhakikisha kwamba tunaripoti kitu kwa usahihi zaidi tukija kwenye professional kwenye quality of reporting report reporting based on multiple sources hii tumekuwa tukiiona kila wakati kwamba tunapoandika habari tusiwe na single source tujitahidi kuwa na source mbalimbali na hawa source lazima tuwa, tuwagawe katika jenda lakini tuwagawe katika jenda kuhakikisha kwamba tunakuwa na source wa aina zote wanawake wanaume wamezungumza pia hata ukiangalia age ukiangalia makundi kulingana na na elimu kulingana na uh, taaluma kulingana na mahali wanapofanyia kazi hii inakusaidia kuwa na sauti mbalimbali mbali kwenye habari yako na story nzuri ni ile ambayo ina sosi nane kuendelea. Hiyo inakuwa ni story nzuri kwa, kwa, kwa mwandishi na hata inapokwenda kwa msomaji amekuwa amepata vitu tofauti tofauti. Lakini comprehensiveness of our information ambayo tunakusanya kutoka kwenye vyanzo mbalimbali mbali, lazima tuangalie perspective. Unapoandika ujue kwamba hiki ninachokiandika kina mwelekeo wa kiuchumi. Hiki ninachokiandika kina mwelekeo labda wa kisiasa. Hiki ninachokiandika kina mwelekeo wa kimazingira. Lazima tangu mwanzo ujue hiki ninachokiandika kina mwelekeo gani lakini pia lazima ujue root causes ya of event issue au problem unachokiandika mzizi wake ni nini hmm? na kwa namna gani hicho unachokiandika umekwenda kukichimbua mpaka kwenye mzizi hiyo yote itakusaidia kuja kupata taarifa nyingi ambazo utakuja kuandika kitu kwa kina na kitasaidia kita kuwa na habari nzuri ambayo itasomeka lakini inakwenda kuwa na impact baadaye lakini tusisahau kitu muhimu sana kwenye kuandika habari zetu ni historical background. Tunakumbuka kuweka background. Background inasaidia sana msomaji kuelewa kile kitu kimeanzia wapi. Na tukumbuke kwamba sio mapya tunayoyaandika leo, ni mambo ambayo either yameshawahi kuandikwa, wataalamu wameshaandika kwenye vitabu mbalimbali, kuna maandiko mbalimbali, kuna tafiti mbalimbali zimewahi kufanyika. Je, haya yote tunaweza kuya, kuyaweka na kuya, kuyachambua na kuweka sehemu kama background ambayo itamsaidia msomaji kupata taarifa zaidi na kuelewa nini kile kinachozungumzwa lakini opinion kuwe na view point ambazo zina opposi na zinazokubali unapokwenda kufanya story kuna ambao watakuwa wanakubali wanaunga mkono lakini kuna ambao watakuwa wanasema no kitu hiki kiko hivi na hivi na hivi alimradi anahoja lakini pia je habari yako inaeleweka hmm? lazima uwe na good basic storyline structure yake unapo flow logic je inakuepo mtu anaposoma anakuelewa hayo mambo yote yanayowepo figure tunavyoziweka kwenye content yetu je zinasaidia msomaji wa kawaida kabisa ambaye tunamwandikia anaweza kuelewa anaweza kupata taarifa lakini ethical issues je tumetoa nafasi ya mtu ku reply kwa nilipenda nianze na hayo sasa nikienda kwenye kushare experience yangu mimi katika kuandika hizi habari kwanza ni lazima u develop interest ya kuandika habari za uhifadhi na, na, na utalii na masuala ya ya mazingira kwa ujumla ukiwa na interest maana yake utasoma utasoma research mbalimbali utasoma taarifa mbalimbali za ndani na nje ambazo zitakusaidia wewe kujua mambo mbalimbali mbali. unaandika mfano kuhusu uh, mamlaka ya hifadhi ya eneo la Ngorongoro lazima utakuwa umesoma kuhusiana na Ngorongoro 
na kama umeisoma kuhusiana na ngorongoro zaidi utakwenda mbali zaidi kuchimba zaidi na kuja na kitu cha tofauti unaandika kuhusu tanapa lazima ujue kwamba unajua kuna tanapa ujue kuna mamlaka ya hifadhi ya ngorongoro unajua kuna maeneo ya ba mapori ya akiba kuna mapori tengefu lazima uyajue na katika kusoma huko utajua labda tuna hifadhi ngapi Tanzania tuna maeneo mangapi yaliyohifadhiwa tuna mapori mangapi ya akiba tuna mapori mangapi tengefu mathalan sisi ya Tanzania tuna hifadhi za taifa 22 eh alafu tuna mapori ya akiba 32 tuna mapori tengefu 18 tuna jumuiya za hifadhi za zinazomilikiwa na jamii ziko 32 lakini ambazo ziko active ni 16 lakini kuna maeneo ya mtawanyiko ambayo yanatumiwa na wanyama lazima uyajue kuna shoroba zipo lazima uzijue. Kwa hiyo reading researching pia mimi imekuwa ikinisaidia kwa sababu pia nimekuwa na interest. Lakini kuwa familia na ripoti mbalimbali ambazo zinatolewa. Zimetoka ripoti mbalimbali. Mathala Tawiri hivi karibuni ametoa ripoti. Ye, yeah, tumesoma sisi waandishi. Nimekuwa nikijitahidi kupata nafasi ninasoma hizo ripoti. Kwa hiyo kusoma hizo ripoti ndipo ninapata tips za kuja kufanyia uh, story zaidi, kufanya story kwa kina. Lakini kwa kusoma hizo ripoti imenisaidia kuelewa zaidi mambo mbalimbali hata ninapoandika kuhusiana na kitu fulani na kuwa tayari ninaelewa nao wa kutosha. Lakini networks tuna Tanzania National Park wapo. Lazima uwe na network nao, Tawiri, Tawa, uh, Wizara ya Mali Asili na Utalii, WMA ziko nyingi, tour operators na other stakeholders wa tourism industry wako wengi sana ambao ni muhimu sana katika habari zetu lakini social platform mbalimbali mbali za hizi taasisi na network mbalimbali ni ambazo zinaweza kutusaidia kwa hii ni namna ambayo nimekuwa nikitumia ikinisaidia katika kufanya kazi zangu experience niloipata kutoka Thailand kama nilivyosema nimejaribu kueleza hapa kwa kidogo ambako mtu anaweza ukapata picha halisi ya Thailand ikoje a uh, Thailand kwa wale wale ni end user pro, wa hizi products za wildlife na wako tayari kuzinunua kwa gharama yoyote ile na licha ya jitihada mbalimbali ambazo zimefanyika lakini bado matumizi ya hizi ile product ni kubwa kwa maana ya kwamba wengi wanaamini ni, 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 ni utajiri ni ufahari ku, ku, kuwa na product kama ile mtu akiwa labda na zawadi akakupa ambayo imetengenezwa labda na pembe ya ndovu kwa kile ni ufahari au mtu akiwa na wengine wana imani kabisa kwamba inaongeza nguvu za kiume wengine wana imani na tibu gout wengine wana imani tofauti tofauti kwa hiyo yote inachangia kwa kiasi kikubwa viumbe hawa kuanza kupotea kwa sababu wapo wa, soko lipo watumiaji wapo lakini jitihada mbalimbali zimefanywa na nchi husika na kwa, kwa, kwa na sio Thailand tu kwa kule ni Asia kwa maana Vietnam China wale ndio big consumer wa hizi product kutoka huku kwetu. Uh, kule kingine nilicho kama nilivyoeleza hapo ni kwamba consumer ya ya ya, ya world demand ya consumer ni kubwa sana. Kwa maana kwamba hizi product wanazihitaji kule. Kwa sababu kule kuna masoko. Niliweka onda kwa kwenye soko moja ya Amlet Market iko kule. Unakuta product zinauzwa. Ndio watakwambia hii product sio halisi, lakini ukiangalia ni ni product ambayo ina uhalisia ndani yake kwa namna ambavyo soko unaliona. Lakini pia jitihada mbalimbali kama nilivyosema hapo awali zimefanyika. Kwa maana kumekuwa na ushirikiano hapo baina ya wale watunga sera eh, na wale wasimamizi wa sheria na private sector. Kwamba kumekuwa na kampeni mbalimbali lakini hawa waendesha mashtaka kama nilivyotoka kuzungumza hapo wamekuwa na utaratibu wa kushirikiana kuendesha haya mashtaka. Kwanza wamepewa elimu na kama wamepewa elimu maana yake sasa hivi jitihada zinafanyika kwamba kesi inapokwenda kule hatua zinachukuliwa kama hapa kwetu inapofanyika sasa hivi mtu akikamatwa na meno ya tembo akikamatwa na hizi nyara za serikali hatua zinachukuliwa na kama hatua zinachukuliwa maana yake kuna kuwa na angalau uoga lakini private sector kule nimeona imeshirikishwa ime sana kwa karibu kwa sababu zinafanyika kampeni mbalimbali ambazo zinasaidia sasa watu kupunguza matumizi ya hizi hizi product lakini pia kule nimekuta social media zinatumika zaidi sasa wamebadili mwelekeo watu wamekwenda kwenye social media katika kuuza hizi product wana zile emoji mbalimbali zinatumika katika kuuza hizi product kwa ni rahisi mtu kujua ehe sasa pale kuna product fulani inafanyika kwa namna anavyo advertise kwa hayo yote nayaeleza kwa sababu kuna connection kubwa sana kati ya Asia na Afrika kwenye hizi product kwa sababu hao ndio consumer wa hizi product. Kwa unaposoma haya mambo ukaelewa kwa sababu ripoti mbalimbali mbali zipo zinaonyesha namna gani China ina consume namna gani Vietnam ina consume na Thailand 
inakusaidia kuongeza thamani kwenye stori zako inakusaidia kuongeza kitu ambacho msomaji akisoma ataelewa kwamba pembe ya ndovu inavyochukuliwa hapa inapokwenda kule china inakwenda kufanya nini hmm? ngozi inapochukuliwa hapa kitu fulani kinapochukuliwa hapa ambacho ni nyara ya serikali inakwenda kule inakwenda kufanya nini na kwa nini inakuwa na thamani kubwa kwa hiyo ni mambo ambayo waandishi wa habari tukiyajua yanakwenda kutusaidia sana lakini pia kingine consume the uh, consumer demand reduction and the private sector engagement nimeizungumzia hapo lakini kingine nilijifunza masuala yao ya culture za kule wanavyoishi jinsi ambavyo wanaabudu Miungu yao Buddha kule ni Mungu ambaye wanamwabudu na kumwamini sana ni mambo ambayo pia niliyaona lakini pia ukuo uruhusiwi kuikosoa serikali ya monarch lakini pia kingine ambacho nilikuwa take home kule nilijifunza ni kuhusiana na swala la vyakula kule kuna vyakula vingi sana na ambavyo vya kila aina ambavyo vinauzwa mitaani na kuna modern ya mama, mama ntilie kwa yote haya ninaeleza kwa sababu pia ni story ambazo nilikwenda kule lakini nikarudi na hizi story kuja kuieleza jamii yangu. Kuna ambavyo jamii yangu imejifunza kwa mfano swala la vyakula, kuna swala la mama ntilie, mm, jamii yangu imejifunza. Lakini how to seek collaboration? Namna gani sasa tuna, tunafanya sasa kwenye kutafuta hizi story zetu na ku, kutengeneza tips mbalimbali mbali, na mpaka unakuja sasa kuandika idea yako. Mwanzo nilizungumzia swala la network. Una network kiasi gani? Mm, umejenga network na tanapa umejenga network na ngorongoro umejenga network na tawiri je wanapotoa ripoti zao kwenye website unazisoma hayo ni mambo ambayo lazima tuyafanyie kazi je unajua historia na kwa kifupi tu labda nikiwapitisha kwenye historia ya uhifadhi nchini uhifadhi ulianza mwaka 1891 na sheria ya kudhibiti uh, uwindaji na usimamizi wa nani wa, 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 wa nyara za serikali ilianzishwa wakati huo na serikali ya kikoloni lakini ilienda mwaka 1905 wakoloni walianzisha mapori ya akiba na kama nilivyotaja pale mwanzoni tuna mapori ya akiba 32 hapa nchini kwa hayo tu ni mambo ambayo pia mwandishi lazima pia uyajue mm? una na pori la kwanza la akiba kabisa ilikuwa ni eneo la selu ambao maeneo yale yalikuwa na mkusanyiko wa wanyama wengi na wakubwa na bayonua yake ilikuwa wakati huo ni kubwa sana tofauti na hali ilivyo sasa hivi kuna changamoto nyingi kule katika eneo la selu lakini mwaka 1921 serikali ya ukoloni wa Uingereza walianzisha idara ya wanyamapori. Eh? Ikaanzishwa na ndio ikaje ikaanzisha sasa selu ilikuja ikaanzishwa mwaka 1922. Kwa hiyo historia kama hiyo tunavyojua pia inatusaidia sisi kwenye hata kuandika ile background ile zungumzia pale. Lakini mwaka 1928 pori la Akiba la Kreti ya Ngorongoro lilianzishwa. Eh? Lilianza rasmi na baadaye likaja sasa kuwa, kuanza kuoperate kwa sababu Ngorongoro sasa hivi ili, ilianza mwaka 1959 na ukiangalia ngorongoro ya wakati ule na ngorongoro ya sasa hivi ni tofauti ngorongoro ya wakati ule wakati inaanza kulikuwa na mifugo uh, kulikuwa na watu 1000 ukichanganya na wale ambao walitoka Serengeti wakaletwa ngorongoro 1000 kulikuwa na watu jumla 1000 lakini tunapozungumza sasa hivi ngorongoro ina watu zaidi ya laki moja. na watu zaidi ya laki moja, asilimia ishirini ndio wanamiliki asilimia themanini ya mifugo iliyopo ngorongoro kwa ujumla wataalamu wanakuambia ngorongoro imeelemewa. Hizo zote ni story ambazo tunatakiwa tuziibue, tusaidie. Lakini kwa nini asilimia ishirini wanamiliki asilimia themanini? Lakini kwa nini pia tunaelezwa kwamba kiwango cha ujinga ngorongoro ni kikubwa sana? Na kama kiwango cha ujinga ngorongoro ni kikubwa, maana yake hata uwezo wa kuwa kutambua umuhimu ile rasilimali utakuwa mdogo. Ni rahisi kushirikiana na majangili. Na kama mifugo ni mingi kiasi hicho, migogoro baina ya wanyama na binadamu inaongezeka na mathalan hivi karibuni tumeelezwa aliingia chu ndani fisi kwenye boma akaua kondoo 30 tayari pale ni kisasi lakini katika eneo la la Tarangire Manyara kuna kuna simba waliuawa kwenye ile eneo na imekuwa ni muendelezo kwa sababu ya kulipiza kisasi kwa hayo tu ukiyajua ni mambo ambayo yatakusaidia sana mwandishi wa habari ku kufanya kazi yako lakini je unaijua mipaka ya Tanapa Tanapa kama nilivyosema ina hifadhi 22 Tanapa ilianza mwaka 1959 mm. na wakati huo ikiwa na sasa hivi hifadhi ina, ina ukubwa wa eneo la, la, la hifadhi za taifa za Tanzania 22 ni kilomita za mraba laki moja na 1464 ambao ni 11 11 ya ardhi ya Tanzania hiyo yote ukijua itasaidia 
kwa sababu kumekuwa na migongano ya muda mrefu wakisema kwamba eneo la uhifadhi ni kubwa sana ambalo linachukua eneo kubwa kiasi kwamba wa Tanzania labda hawana eneo kuna kunapokuwa na hii migogoro ni rahisi hata kulipiza kisasi kulipiza kisasi ni kama hivyo kuwa wanyama kwa kuweka sumu kama itoshi kushirikiana na majangili kwa haya yote ni mambo ambayo tunaweza tukayajua yakatusaidia lakini wakati huo hifadhi tanapa zina hifadhi zinaanzishwa kulikuwa na wa Tanzania milioni tisa wakati tunapata huru kulikuwa na Tanzania milioni tisa lakini sasa hivi tuko zaidi ya wa Tanzania milioni 55 ardhi imebaki ile ile tunazidi kuongezeka na maeneo yale ya kulishia mifugo yanazidi kupungua kwa sababu pia ya mabadiliko ya tabia nchi lakini kingine ambacho mwandishi ambayo unachopaswa kufanya na ambacho mimi nimekuwa nikikifanya ni kuupdate diary yangu kila mara na yapdate diary yangu kuwa na contact tofauti tofauti lakini website mbalimbali nazitembelea kuwa na ripoti mbalimbali ambazo nikinazihifadhi kwenye kompyuta yangu na na, na, na zisoma. lakini naposema kingine pia keep close ni kwamba unajenga rapport kiasi gani na hao sosi wako how do you connect with your sources eh kiasi kwamba wakiwa na information yoyote lazima wakutafute na lazima washirikiane na wewe kuhakikisha kwamba ile information uh, inatoka ina, ina na inakuwa weli equipped kwamba ni kiasi gani pia na wewe kama mwandishi ile habari yako unaidandika vizuri unaweza kujenga ile trust kwa source lakini nyingine ni ku grab opportunities opportunity ni nyingi kama hii hapa ijnet ni opportunity moja wapo lazima tuwe kwenye opportunity kama hizi na nyinginezo ambazo zinakuwezesha mwandishi wa habari kwenda kufanya habari za uchunguzi mimi nimeweza kwenda kufanya habari ya uchunguzi katika eneo kule la Burunge nikaandika solution journalism nikielezea namna gani WMA ya Burunge ina mafanikio makubwa ya kukusanya mapato ya zaidi ya shilingi bilioni mbili kwa mwaka ambao bilioni moja inabaki kwenye vijiji kumi, ambao ni sawa na shilingi milioni mia moja kwa kila kijiji ni pesa nyingi sana ambazo wanazipangia budget kwa ajili ya matumizi yao ya maendeleo kwa watu hawa hawawezi kwenda kushiriki kwenye ujangili sababu moja kwa moja pesa zile zinawasaidia kujenga shule, kujenga hospitali, wanaona matunda ya uhifadhi. Sasa zipo WMA 32. 16 ndo ziko active. Je, yeah, hizi WMA, WMA zinaendelezwa kama ziendelezwe? Nini kinaendelea? Na hizi WMA zinatusaidia kukinga hizi hifadhi. Lakini pia pia ni muhimu sana mwandishi uwe na sikio la habari, uwe na pua ya habari. Namna gani unakuwa na nusa habari? Mfano mimi WMA kwenda Burunge kufanya story nilikwenda kule na watu wa USAID nilipofika kule katika mazungumzo nikaona ni ni, 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 ni habari nika noti nikaweka pembeni kwa unapokwenda kwenye mikutano mbalimbali do you not eh? unapokwenda kwenye makongamano una noti unaweka pembeni ukinoti na kusaidia to make follow up na kuja kutafuta namna ya kufanya hiyo habari kama nilivyokuwa nimeeleza mengi nimeyakava hapo katika namna gani pits, p, p, tips na chips na pitch tunafanya through reading report research mfano kuna lion research imetoka inaelezea hali ya, ya, ya simba nchini ukisoma kule unajikuta kuna mambo mengi ambayo ukiendeleza ukitafuta na wataalamu unapata habari nzuri sana ya kina lakini experience nimechukua mfano burunge nilikwenda pale nikapata experience nilirudi kwa sababu niliona hapa kuna habari interaction unapokutana na watu wataalamu mbalimbali umekwenda kwenye makongamano sio unakusanya habari pale unaondoka how do you interact with those experts wanakupa information kwa kiasi gani na zile information unazotumia kiasi gani unajenga network na wale watu socialization na yenyewe inakusaidia social media platform follow up na make impact ya story yako lazima uhakikishe kwamba umefanya impact story katika ile story uliyoiandika hii ni mifano mbalimbali ya story ambazo nime, nimezifanya na ningependa penda kushare nanyi hizi linki kila mtu atazisoma kwa wakati wake ni story ambazo zipo nilizifanya ambazo zinahusiana na masuala ya uhifadhi na utalii na zilikuwa na impact kubwa mfano hii story ya kwanza ilisaidia kutungwa kwa zile kanuni kanuni zilikuwepo mezani kwa waziri miaka nenda rudi lakini kwa sababu tuliandika hii series story ilisaidia kanuni sasa hivi ziko in place kwa so this is the impact na ni document kama impact ya story kwa usiandike ukaishia hapo andika pia na make follow up na swala nyingine ni story fao hii ya ya ya, ya ya yeah, ni story hii hii ya ya ya, ya, ya shoroba jinsi ambavyo zinapotea na as of now tuna shoroba mbili tu ambazo ni hai the rest zimeshakufa i think inaweza kuishia hapo kama kuna swali au kuna comment and this page is quotation ambazo ni food of thought kwa sisi waandishi wa habari ambao tunafanya kazi ya uandishi wa habari kila siku asante uh, salome 
if you could leave the quotes there, uh, alafu utatoa is Atilio Kams. Asante uh, sana, nimeshukuru, nimefurahia Kiswahili uh, sanifu. Hakuna uh, shenga, hakuna kuharibu. And thank you so much uh, for that great uh, uh, presentation. Um, I have come out with three things. Uh, one of the things is uh, when you were to na waka, naangalia sana sana journalism ya siku hizi, tuna single source sana. Mtu anaandika story kutoka kwa mtu mmoja. Hata kama ni mtu mwingine unapiga hii side ingine, uh, you don't give them a right of reply. All you interview, you know, the, 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 uh, the objective voice, uh, so to speak. Uh, I'm shocked uh, kusikia umetuambia tuwe at least tuwe na source wanane. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's that's epitome of good journalism. Uh, going in depth and, you know, being serious with what we're doing, eight sources, I'll keep that in mind. I don't think I've done that personally. Um, the other thing I've uh, come out with, stories are wildlife crime. We have to look at the demand side and also the supply. Mahali supply in Sisi, sana sana, tumebarikiwa East African, jumia, you know, Africa mashariki, tume to uh, to yeah to uh, me so we have the supply side and then the, there is that other side of the demand and uh, that's very important aspect and number three is something else that when you wait to go out to fatili follow ups uh, that's a very good point and uh, I'll just ask you one question uh, a lot of people are commenting uh, your presentation and uh, Rujira from Rwanda who you remember from uh, uh, from the workshop in Mombasa, I was asking how you can share the, if you can share the stories, thank you so much, you've already shared. Uh, so Ruji, uh, Yves and everyone else will share these stories. And uh, there is one question uh, from uh, Hele, uh, I believe uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Gila, Asante Dada Salome, Omari from Missouri. My question is what are the challenges that you have been facing when you're reporting on tourism? And related to this is uh, Peter Moirori. Again, you are with him in Mombasa. And Uliza J, Wadishi wa habari, wanapata changa mtogani, wanapota afta habari kuhusu wa husika, waku katika uhalifu kuhusiana na wanyamapori. If you could take that as one question and then we'll go to the next speaker, Salome. Thank you, Aweru. Thank you, Jennifer and uh, Peter for your question. The most challenges are uh, sources. As I said, we have to have more than eight sources, but still there is a big challenge in getting some sources. But uh, how do you do? And uh, what I'm doing always is uh, making sure that I have a big network with these sources. Make, first, of all, to, is, uh, first of all, is to make sure that uh, you are building the trust with these sources. If they are giving you a, a certain information, you, you make sure that you are utilizing that information to the extent that they will uh, you you are not misquoting them and uh if you are using their store their, their information that well i think they will give you a ushirikiano wa kutosha sana and uh as you you are getting one source is a connection to another sources and if you go to this meeting forums and uh other workshops try to call to, to have the number of these sources try to talk to them try to explain yourself who you are try to show your work that's where the trust will come. And then the, it's easier to get the, the sources. Another challenge is just uh, geographical location of this uh, uh, to, uh, national parks and the other uh, like uh, Maporia, Kiba and uh, other places. Where they are located is very far and sometimes it needs financial help to reach there. This is a very challenge for us. But uh, if you are having a network, it's easy, for instance, for Tanapa to help you to reach the place and uh, meet some uh, expertise. I think that's a ma two major challenges that uh, I have experience with in, uh, in working in this uh, industry. Thank you so much, Salome. Those are valid challenges. And uh, thank you for, you know, for pointing us to the right directions how to make networks. And, and I think as we say, EJN is a network and I'm glad to note that uh, our director, James Fan has joined us. I welcome very much uh, uh, James. He'll be showing us uh, the work we do and how uh, through us you can get these sources of stories. And also sometimes we have these opportunities for funding. 
you to go do those stories in those uh, unreachable areas as you have said, Salome. And uh, now James, uh, we'll have the last speaker, which is Atilio Tangalile, and then we'll have James to wrap this uh, for us. Uh, so Mr. Atilio, I hope you are able to take this in about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, before that, uh, I don't know if you've managed to get your video, uh, but I want to introduce you as you unmute. And Mr. Atilio Tangalile is a veteran journalist, a media consultant, and a former program staff at the World Wildlife Fund, that's WWF. Uh, during his time as a journalist, he works as a managing editor of the Habari Corporation, who are the publishers of the African, the Rai, Tanzania, and the Dimba newspapers. <laughs> he has also worked as a campaign manager for the Selu and is an author of two books. He has just completed a book on the Selu, which uh, we do hope, Mr. Tagalile, you can mention briefly to us. Uh, if you're ready, uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Waweru. I am ready to, to share my experiences with you guys. Uh, I have the, the, the presentation, but I think the, 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 my colleagues will be able to go through it after my presentation. But uh, I think you can also see it on the screen. Yes, I will basically, you know, there's nothing as difficult as speaking after somebody like Kadushi has already spoken. Uh, is challenging in the sense that most of the things I spoke, I'd also prepared myself for that. For instance, the structure of the of the of the of the wildlife in Tanzania and what have you. But therefore, now I'll just concentrate myself on two main areas: uh, forays that are repeatedly being made by elephants uh, or jumbos, as we like to call them, uh, to, to 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 human settlements why there have been an increase in this. And uh, the need for our journalists, local journalists, to do some work on this uh, in the name of what uh, Kadushi also appealed before he was leaving the scene. Uh, there have been increased forays of Jumbo to, uh, to, hum in human, to human settlements. And uh, we have to find out why we have this problem. And in the process, many people have been killed. For instance, uh, in the last two months, a total of 16 people have been killed. Why do they continue to do this? But I'll also speak a bit about uh, Selu because Kadushi mentioned about it. Actually, there is no uh, game reserve. Actually, Selu is a world, uh, what, what is it? It's a world, um, uh, it, I mean, it was inscribed by the UNESCO. Is a I'm forgetting the name. The World Heritage. World yeah, it's Heritage a World Heritage. Site. Yeah, site. So why Selu was the most poached area in East Africa? Because in 1976 alone, it had 110,000 elephants. But by 2014, the, I remember this it was also mentioned by 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 Kadushi. By 2014, uh, the poaching had reduced the number of elephants in that area. To 15,217. It had about uh, 2,700 black rhinos, the only species in this area, I mean in Africa. But by 2014, the number of uh, black rhinos had been reduced by less than 30. So you can imagine the, the kind of poaching. And that's why it was actually uh, renamed, uh, sort of given the name of industrial poaching. Now, in short, 90% of the Selu wildlife was reduced by poaching. But now, by 2015 and up to about two to three years ago, uh, there, there have been an increase of elephants in the Selu. But all of a sudden, we find ourselves, we are facing another problem that requires investigation by our journalists. And that problem is, increased forays of these jumbos to human settlements. What do we do uh, in order to sort of uh, turn around this problem? So that is one area I would like uh, our journalists, especially Tanzanian journalists, to do some research uh, with, the express, uh, with, the, with the aim of, of, of trying to find out what is the solution to that. The other problem we have that we actually need to, to, to deal with is investigation. How do we conduct investigation? Sometimes it's easier said than that, but how do we go about it? 
this is an area I would like to, to sort of uh, 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 work on to try to so to, to show some 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 points or uh, some some leads on how we can do about it. Now let's start with the forays. Why is it that we have this problem in southern Selu and northern Selu? Elephants living, and uh, le let us remember one thing: the fifteen thousand. Uh, 217 elephants in the Selu, that is the highest concentration of elephants in Tanzania. Tanzania has about, uh, right now, about 45,000, between 45 and 50,000 elephants. But most of them are concentrated in the Selu. Now, the elephants in the Selu have started moving southward. There was a question I would like to link also there that was mentioned by Kadushi, and uh, which was actually prompted by a question by I think that was a Kenyan who wanted to know whether uh, 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 Al Shabab are benefiting from wildlife crime in Mozambique. We all know that uh, Al Shabab are in Mozambique, in northern part of it. But I would like to, re to, to, to remind our colleagues that the Selu Game Reserve, which is the biggest game reserve in, in Africa, with 54,640 square kilometers that is bigger than Rwanda, Burundi, and Zanzibar put together. Also links with Nyasa, uh, uh, Nyasa Game Reserve, which is in Northern Mozambique. What does it mean? It means that elephants from Northern Mozambique move into Seru and vice versa. Now, if Ashababa are controlling Northern Mozambique, it means they are able to, 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 to sort of harvest elephants from, uh, from Northern Mozambique which as we all know is currently under Al-Shabaab, unless we are told otherwise. So if they have the elephants in the area they control, uh, although we, we don't have facts, we don't have research, certainly they will make use of those of, 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 of ivory. It means uh, we, as, as, as pointed by my colleague, most of the, of the ivory you see in the world come either from Tanzania or from Mozambique actually, and the Kenya. Now, for Tanzanian journalists, if they work on this, it will help to, to, to it, will, it, will, it will be a push to the government to act. The question now we need to ask ourselves is, after the entry into power of the fifth fed administration of President Magufuli, he succeeded during his first two years to stamp out poaching. But why has it started? What is the problem? We, our, our, our journalists needed to work on this. But secondly, we also need to find out why these elephants are moving upwards. Why are they living? What is going on? So we have also to have to find out. Having said that, now let me go to my last subject, which I wanted, which I wanted specifically to deal with, and this is investigation. Now, how do we do investigation? There was a question from Felix. He asked about government engagement. But I would have rather also wanted to know from him if he had gone further to find out when the government has already given you all the facts and the stats, what do you do in order to, to, to make yourself a story? Now, how do we investigate this? It is always uh, good for, for, for our journalists not to start from the top when you are, when you are working on, a, on, a, on any investigative story. Start from below, from the ground, from the surface. What do I mean? Uh, if you start from the top, meaning from the CEOs, the heads of TANAPA, Tanzania National Park, or the heads of the Minister of uh, Natural Resources and Tourism, when you get stuck, that is the end of your IJ, you are in the investigative uh, journalism. So you always have to start from the scratch, from, from downwards. How do you start from, the, from downward? Eh? For instance, once you decide you want to do an IJ, for instance, uh, uh, on, on wildlife, you start, it's, it's better to start with game rangers. Start with the people who live in the area. Start, now let's take this question of killings by, by these jumbos, especially when they move to human settlement. You have to start with the people who are affected. You have to start with the history. Eh? Is this a new thing? Did they have this kind of attacks in the past? If they did have, what prompted it? So when you start from there, it will give you a sense of where, uh, where to get on with the story. 
then you need to also make sure that there are certain things that may not give you a hint. They look very, 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 uh, uh, I mean, you, you, may, you, may, you may think that uh, they may not give you anything, but they, they hide. They have very good information in it. For instance, newspapers, eh? read between the lines. You, you certainly get something out of it. So do research, as, as, as once emphasized by, by, by Kitomari. Do a lot of research. If you, if you don't read this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, these tips, if you don't do these tip, tips, you don't, do, you don't do this pitching of the stories and what have you, you will get lost. So try to start working from, the, from down, going upward. And in that way, you will find yourself, you have enough material that you can take further. Uh, because at the end of the day, you must always make sure that whatever you have is almost 75% complete story. Now, when you go to the CEOs or the heads of these institutions in the wildlife, you go there to confirm your stories. You don't go there to ask stories because the top guys, they always uh, like to hide their stories. So always try to start from down, going upward. Uh, that is that is also extremely important. Otherwise, the rest of my 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 my, my presentation is uh, is clear to all, and uh, you you you'll get whatever I wanted to say. Uh, but I would rather more be ready for questions than anything else. You can ask me even questions that you wanted to ask Kabushi because I've had two years of as a campaign manager for 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 Selu. I was specifically responsible for Selu. Campaign media for what? I was responsible for anti-poaching and, uh, and uh, what you call uh, uh, industrial development in the Seru. You know, once the, the game reserve is called a World Heritage Site, it means it is shared, uh, not only by Tanzanians, but also by the international community. It is also for the posterity, not only for you guys. So. Uh, whatever you want to do, any project you want to conduct, say for instance in the Selu, you have to ask UNESCO. So th those are the questions that the journalists need to know. You have to ask questions because once it is called a world, uh, a world uh, uh, heritage site, it no longer belongs to you alone. It also belongs to the international community. Thank you, Mr. Owen. I'm now ready for questions from any area. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Atilio. Atilio. Uh, sorry, Atilio. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for that correction. Um, Thank you for your uh, presentation. And uh, um, there is something you you said uh, that um, you didn't explain uh, further. You left it hanging for uh, the journalists to investigate. It, it, like the jumbos are coming increasingly coming to human settlements. Um, yeah. From your experience, uh, you know, working with these uh, at CELU and with WWF, um, what do you think uh, this could be? Uh, has uh, the large, you know, being, you know, taken, are uh, there developments that are coming or why? Why are they moving to, you know, human settlements? Uh, do you have an inkling of these? Uh, that's why I wanted our journalists to find out, but I can give a hint. The hint is that uh, hum the, this wildlife, like uh, jumbos and uh, even the, 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 the rhinos and what have you, this animal always like peace. They want to stay, uh, wherever they are staying, they want to stay peacefully. And the jumbos are very, very intelligent animals. In fact, uh, once you disturb them, they also stop even mating. Once you disturb them, if there is increased poaching in the area, they, they tend to change the, even their eating habits. Instead of eating, say, in the, or on the day, they eat at night, and they move in deep forest where human beings cannot even uh, try to get into, because uh, those are the areas which are uh, populated by uh, leopards, and, 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 and the other uh, wild animals like lions. So they must be moving out of these uh, game reserves because prob probably there is a disturbance. 
there is development going on. You remember I said earlier on that uh, once you declare a, play, a, a, a game reserve as a World Heritage Site, it means a certain development cannot be undertaken in that area. Now, if you undertake those developments in those areas, they will move out. But this is what I wanted the Tanzanian journalists to find out. Uh, why are they moving out? And why is there an increase in this jump of forays into human settlement now than ever before? Actually, it is not only in the Selu, also in other areas uh, around the segregated water view. You, we have been hearing stories from the media about people being killed by elephants. These things were unheard of uh, uh, seven, eight years ago. Why is this in, why is there an increase in this? So let them find out from, because they, they, they want government engagement, whatever it is, but this, this is where to start from, you see? Because no one is talking, the government yeah. is quiet, yeah. Thank you so much for that. I think that's a very valid uh, point because I think one of the other challenges we have is as a journalist, you also need to come up with story ideas. And uh, yeah, indeed, human wildlife conf conflict is increasingly going, you know, on an upward trajectory. Uh, and it's always good to uh, to go back to where, you know, the rains are beating. Why are we having elephants now coming out? So yeah, I also take the challenge and it's a, it, it's the Changamoto Mzuri about Nenza and Zia Apo. And now, Mr. Atilio, I'll ask you to stay on the line as we hear from uh, EJN's executive director about the work we do here. And uh, dear participants, we have only 15 minutes, but you have a really burning question for Mr. Atilio, uh, for Salome, and for James. Kindly ask it now. Uh, because I'm hoping uh, James is able to do this uh, in about 10 minutes so that we have five minutes to uh, to do the closing remarks. Uh, Mr. Fan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hyundu. Hi, everyone, and I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, Atilio, can you uh, stop sharing your screen so I can share mine? Yeah, I, I cannot share my PowerPoint, Atilio, until you stop sharing your screen, please. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Atilio, I really liked your presentation, by the way. I'm, I'm just curious, I don't know if you can answer very quickly, what is the status of the hydropower project in the Salu at this point? Is it going ahead? Uh, this this uh, hydropower project uh, starts from Stigler's Gorge, which, which we used to call Stigler's Gorge. Now that Stigler's Gorge has died, what we have now and which is going on is the construction of a dam, mm -hmm. which will be the second biggest in Africa after the one which is being built in, in, in Ethiopia. Now to give people a sense of uh, how much, how big this dam is, it is, it is going to be 1,350 square kilometers. Now for those, uh, for Tanzanians and for, uh, for those outside our, uh, our, our country, to get a sense of this, it is, it is bigger than the Dar es Salaam region, which is both a commercial city and a region. Dar es Salaam is 1,300 square kilometers. And uh, the dam is going to be 50, 50 square kilometers uh, more than Dar es Salaam. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a huge thing. And we should expect climatic change. Uh, yeah, that's going to really impact the wildlife too. Yeah. And uh, this dam is actually situated in the northern part of the Selu, which used to constitute what is called photographic part of the Selu. You know, Selu has two types of tourism. One is the photographic part where people won't go, see animals and live without taking anything from that part. The second part is, is hunting. They are hunting blocks. And the people go there and they hunt old animals. And they use professional hunters so that they can get trophies. So there are two kinds of tourism in that place. But the Northern part uh, where you have the number of giraffe. I don't think you have seen it anywhere in East Africa. 
because you see groups of 50, 100 at a go. That is the area where this thing is being situated, but not in the entire thing, no. The, the area where this dam is being built will be 3.5% of the Selu. Yeah, that is 3.5% of 54,640 square kilometers. And as I told, as I said earlier, it is bigger than uh, Rwanda, which is 26,000 square kilometers, uh, uh, Burundi, which is 27,000 square kilometers, and uh, Zanzibar put together. And you are left with 1,000 square kilometers hanging. Thank you, Atilio. So I know that the dam project is a very big issue, but difficult to cover. But uh, anyway, uh, I know we only have about 10 minutes left. So I'm quickly uh, going to go through uh, and to brief you all on the Earth Journalism Network. Thank you very much for joining this roundtable. And uh, EJN is uh, happy to be uh, working in Tanzania. We, Our mission, if you're not familiar with us, is to improve the quantity and quality of environmental coverage by empowering journalists like yourselves. So uh, very happy to be working with you on this. Uh, we, as you can see, we are a global community of journalists dedicated to covering environment and climate. Um, we have now about 13,000 members from more than 180 countries around the world. Um, and uh, we cover topics uh, not just wildlife and biodiversity, but also climate change, uh, oceans and fisheries, food and agriculture, forests, uh, environmental health, increasingly uh, covering health issues like zoonotic diseases. Uh, we work, we support all different formats, including print and TV and radio, uh, also online and data journalism. Some of our main activities, uh, kind of training and workshops are, it's kind of our bread and butter. We've been doing that now for 16 years, 17 years now. And, um, and we'd like to have this, these workshops in person. That was the original goal for plan for this round table. But unfortunately, of course, because of COVID, we had to change everything around and now we're doing everything virtually. So we do hope someday to get back to in-person workshops so we can all meet up and get to know each other better. And, and, and I think there's certainly more engagement, but it's great that you're able to join us online. Um, we also give out story grants for journalists. Uh, we're uh, in the process now of awarding some grants for investigative work in Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, and Rwanda uh, on wildlife issues. Uh, we also give out grants to organizations. Um, some of you may be members of JET, the Environmental Journalists uh, Network in Tanzania. And we have given a grant to them, to JET, to do some training work on its own. Uh, we also support geojournalism platforms. These are regional environmental news sites. You can see some pictures of them here. There's one in the Amazon region, Info Amazonia, the Mekong region, in Indonesia, and in South Asia, and the Pacific. Um, in East Africa, we support a website called Info Nile. It's more based uh, uh, in Uganda and the and the, the Nile Basin. Um, we also have a partner in Southern Africa called Oxpeckers that does good investigative work on wildlife trafficking issues. Um, we give out fellowships, uh, so you may be familiar, there are big summits, some planned for this year, including the COP26 Climate Summit planned for Scotland, the um, COP15 Biodiversity Summit that will take place in China, and the UN Ocean Summit in Portugal. Um, those are all planned for when COVID hopefully slows down in later in the year and we can we can travel more, uh, but we award fellowships for journalists to, to attend and cover those summits. Um, and we support investigative reports and special projects uh, like some of the ones uh, EJN is, is doing in East Africa. Uh, we, you know, 
I, as I mentioned, we do support regional partner organizations, not just with grants, but with training activities. And in Tanzania, you know, the JET is one of our partners, but there are many others. And um, that is a really key part of our work because organizations like JET can obviously work on the ground much better. They have, they understand the local situation, speak the local language. So we do try to support these local partners as much as we can. Um, yeah, these numbers, I have to update them. Uh, we now, as I mentioned, have over 13,000 member journalists. We've trained over 12,000 journalists and produce now over 12,500 stories. Um, and we try to keep track of our impacts. Uh, you know, what impacts are the stories, uh, environmental stories having on public policies? Um, and one of them is Tanzania. We had a story, Felix Mwakiembe, I think he's on this call, um, on this round table. He, he did a story on a gold mining project uh, and that was polluting. And as a result of his reporting, the Tanzanian government not only kind of ordered the closure of some of those ac activities, mining activities, but also changed uh, the environmental law in Thailand or eventually led to some changes in the environmental policy. So we're always looking for those kinds of stories. And if you know of impacts that your work has had on public policies or on public debate or behavior, you know, please do tell us about it because it's really important that we show the world that the media does have influence and does have impact. Um, and, you know, and these days we have to, to kind of, you know, show, show the work that we're doing is important. Uh, and, and there are many other uh, impacts we've documented around the world, shutting down a a major road project in Colombia in the Amazon, uh, closing down illegal factories in China, a dam project uh, in Myanmar was uh, scrapped because of uh, reporting that was done there. So um, yeah, this is really important work and your work is really vital to uh, inform the public and hopefully generate better policies. Um, so uh, this project is part of a larger project called East Africa Wildlife Journalism. And the focus, as you can imagine, is, is on conservation, on reporting about wildlife trafficking, about this, these human wildlife conflicts, which Attilio has mentioned, and also about solutions. So not just reporting about problems, but it's really important to report on solutions too. Uh, for instance, you know, there are things you can do to try and keep elephants and other uh, wildlife outside of, of farms. It's not easy, but there are some solutions and the more we can report on them, hopefully the less conflict there is. Uh, in addition to these round tables and the story grants I mentioned, we also did do at least one workshop some of you may attended that, that was in Mombasa. We had hoped to do more. Again, those were canceled. Um, the support from this project is coming from the US government, from USAID and the Department of Interior. Uh, it's always important to know who's funding these activities. Um, we, we, Internews has, has a long history in East Africa. We have uh, an office in Dar es Salaam, uh, that doesn't, doesn't just work on environmental media, but supports all kinds of uh, media development work. And uh, so hopefully some of you've had some experience working with my colleagues in, in, the, in, uh, in Tanzania. Um, and yeah, we have other activities going on in Africa as well. We've done workshops on agriculture, on climate finance, on fisheries in West Africa, on data journalism, so whatever activities we can do to support environmental media, that's, that's our goal. Um, quick brief, you may have already tackled some of these issues about wildlife trafficking, but the global trade is estimated about $23 billion a year. It's very hard to know exactly how much uh, it's all worth, but um, this is considered the fourth largest 
type of illegal trade after trafficking in drugs, weapons, and people. Um, if you include not just wildlife trafficking, but illegal fishing and illegal timber, illegal logging, then the total trade is estimated at $180 billion per year, which is second only to drugs trafficking. So this is a major criminal activity. And sometimes it doesn't get taken as seriously because some people don't, don't care so much about wildlife or, or animals, but it is not just about wildlife, it's about crime. And as we've seen in, uh, in Mozambique, as Atilio mentioned, you know, you've got, uh, you know, re rebels like the Al-Shabaab in northern Mozambique who are profiting off, off you know, cr criminal trafficking and uh, supporting themselves that way. And that's obviously a big problem for everyone. So, um, you know, East Africa is a major source of, of supply for wildlife products. It's a transshipment hub and there's also demand, especially for bushmeat which is uh, kind of, you know, also an, another problem. Um, and it's not well reported. Usually we only hear about it when there's a, an arrest and then there's no follow-up. You know, what happens to the people who are arrested? Who was, uh, and often the people who are, are arrested are the mules, the, the, the people doing the transport, whereas the, the bosses, the crime bosses are, are not touched. So what happens to those people are arrested, are they convicted? Are they prosecuted? Are they in jail? What happens to the people who are behind it? Are they continuing to do their, their, their trafficking? These are all issues that we really need journalists to report on. It is on the hour now, so if there are questions, uh, you know, let me know. Um, I, I see questions in Swahili. Unfortunately, I, I can't answer it. Kiyundu, do you want me to go on? Or do you have do you have any questions for me? Oops, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I'm saying thank you uh, for ending up on good time. Uh, I don't see any new questions. Uh, the one in Kiswahili, some of them had been addressed one way uh, or the other. Um, Anyone there with a burning question that we can put to James, Mr. Atilio, and uh, Salome? Uh, James, in the first one hour, we had uh, Paul Kandushi, uh, who is uh, a transnational and specialized crime division uh, director at Asset for Fetua at uh, National Prosecution Service of Tanzania. And he actually was very good. Uh, he gave us a lot of uh, you know, good hints into how these illegal wildlife crime works and uh, your last point about uh, where do the kingpins, uh, do they ever get sentenced? Uh, he said he gave us the levels from one to four, level one being the people who do the actual poaching, uh, the, the bottom there, but he was telling us about the level four, which I thought is very important for us to follow up, is that uh, it's very difficult to arrest uh, the wildlife kingpins as it is for you know, the, the drug trade, but now what they're doing, they are following up, they are following the money, uh, the money trail, illicit uh, money trails. Uh, so they question where is this money coming from? Is it money laundering? And he has said that you'll share with us uh, a few, you know, of these that you've been able to, uh, you know, to capture and uh, even prosecute. Uh, and it's for that, for us, I thought it's very important to you know, to follow the money, so to speak, uh, to also follow, you know, that kind of an angle. And he was really good uh, on that. Uh, Salome, of course, uh, you found Salome presenting, to give us, uh, you know, experience doing this kind of stories, won her several awards, and then, of course, Mr. Atilio. Uh, so I guess if uh, anything else, James, you'd like us to add, or do we edit there? Yeah, I'll, I'll just finish up this last page, I think, um, mm -hmm. I, and I know people need to leave, but um, these are some of the challenges that we face in reporting on wildlife. Main challenge is just a lack of resources. We don't have the time. We don't might not have the money to go and travel and, and cover a story. We don't sometimes we don't have the experience needed to cover a story that you can obviously learn. 
we do face resistance within the newsroom. Uh, sometimes our editors and producers are not so interested. Uh, and also we get threats from vested interests. So you can imagine the criminal syndicates uh, are not happy to be reported on. Um, uh, but I will say, you know, that there are some advantages to reporting wildlife. First of all, stories about what we call charismatic megafauna or big, uh, big animals are, they're pretty popular. People like to read about animals or to view stories, view, view video about animals. So I, I think the question there is, so then how do you make a good story out of less popular wildlife? and out of the, the web of life that is important to sustain, not just the, the big animal, the big game, but also the you know, people. Um, so that is really the kind of central issue we face is how do we turn this global issue into a local story? And some, some tips you can do are to focus on the people who are working on, on wildlife issues that can be scientists or conservationists or government officials or, or local people Maybe it's just a local leader uh, who um, who is you know taking a, uh, an active interest in the issues and is trying to solve conflicts and so on. Uh, you know, people uh, people like to view stories about other people. They also like stories about interesting places. Attilio was talking about the Salu. This is one of the world's great ecosystems. You know, it's uh, it's a world her I believe it's a world heritage site. Uh, you can do stories about not just the Salu, but other very special places, uh, you know, Ngorongoro, obviously, but there are other less famous ones that uh, the, your audience may not know about. And, you know, it's good to report on them and why they're important as, as parks or as wilderness areas. Um, you can report on on why species have useful or, or unique species characteristics. We know that a lot of, uh, not just animals, but plants and other living things are, are useful as medicines or as uh, you can develop useful products out of them. And uh, if we you know, drive these plants or animals to extinction, we won't be able obviously to use them anymore. Um, I don't think I have time to go into trophic cascades, but the point is, you know, there are these webs of life in the ecosystems, and if you disrupt them, for instance, by poaching the elephants or the rhinos or the apex predators like lions and leopards and so on, you 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 change the whole ecosystem and you change the way, you know, that uh, you know you change what resources are available. Um, so it's important that people understand how ecosystems work and how species uh, interconnect with each other. And finally, you know, again, report on solutions. If you just report about problems, people get tired of them. They get apathetic. They get fatalistic. So whenever possible, write about solutions. So, uh, for instance, a famous solution uh, or uh, one solution to uh, encroaching elephants on farms is to have fencing with uh, beehives on them. We know that elephants don't like beehives, and so they'll, they'll stay away from that. And there are others like that that you can report on. So I'm not going to talk about these other EJN projects, but we do, we do report on wildlife trafficking in other regions, including Europe and Asia and Latin America. We have an ongoing biodiversity media initiative. Uh, we just, uh, we're just reviewing story grants from there now. I know we got at least one uh, application from Tanzania or probably several that, uh, that we're, we're considering to support. Um, so uh, keep a lookout in the future. There'll be more story grants available. Uh, there's other story grants coming up soon on for indigenous journalists. If any of you are considered indigenous, uh, uh, part of indigenous group, you can apply for that. There'll be stories on, there'll be grants available on oceans and fisheries if you're interested in reporting on that. Um, so keep a lookout at the ETN website. And then later, 
probably later this year, we hope to offer, or maybe next year, we will definitely be offering more biodiversity story grants. And we're hoping to continue this wildlife journalism project in East Africa. We have to get new funding for that from the US government. We are working on that as well. Um, there are other ways you can engage with EJN in addition to story grants, uh, again, the, the fellowships to the, to the Climate and Biodiversity Summit. We have an EJNet Google group. This is an email list, which you're all welcome to join. Um, you can just look for EJNet at googlegroups.com. Uh, and certainly you should consider registering on earthjournalism.net uh, if you haven't already. Um, this is how you can apply for activities and opportunities. And then we have social media feeds on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and so on. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where this, I believe this round table will be posted. So, you know, look for us online. We're always happy to engage. If you have questions, you know, reach out to us. And just want to thank you again for joining. Um, uh, it's great to be in touch with all of you and I hope we get a chance to work together more. Thank you so much, James, uh, for the tips and for uh, the opportunities. I cannot add into that. Uh, mine is just to say thank you uh, to our speakers, Salome, Kitomali, Atilio, uh, Tangalile, and most importantly to you, our participants. Uh, even though you, uh, we can't see you, we know you're there, we, you've interacted on chats and on Q&A. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we're looking forward to talk to you more you know, collaborate more. And uh, I also would like to thank uh, Ben on our investigative uh, editor who, you know, brought uh, this together. He was on calls, on emails uh, with all the speakers and also the participants. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ben on, and also Stefano, who is our technical assistant. He's been helping us, you know, with uh, putting all this together. So uh, from me here in Nairobi, it's about 6 p.m. from wherever you're joining us from. I do have a good evening and see you soon. Uh, Kwaheri. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes, Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, okay, bye.